Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday, March 22nd, 2021. Mr. Parrott here with your rundown of what we're doing in class today because you cannot be here with us. First off, we got our bell ringer up there for Monday. Make sure that you answer that. Secondly, we do have a March Mammal Madness update. We are starting the second round this week. Um, so there's going to be one video today on Monday, and then our second video for the week is actually going to be on Friday as we finish off the rest of the second round. So um, they're going to do one side of the bracket and then the other side of the bracket. So we will, by the end of this week and by, before spring break, we'll have the first two rounds completed um, for that. So stay tuned for that. You will need to find the March Manual Madness update video in the folder since I cannot play it over the top of my video. So make sure you check that out. It will be in the folder there. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at objective number three in our notes. So this is the modern evidence of change going with natural selection. So what evidence do we have for modern um, natural selection? Uh, and there's about... I want to say there's four things that we're going to be doing with this. Uh, the first thing is by looking at fossils. By examining fossils, scientists can infer the structures of ancient organisms and basically compare what is similar and what is different to what is around today. And from those similarities and differences, we can figure out what traits were good and what traits were bad um, as far as natural selection went with. Um, because... Natural selection would favor the positive traits that made some kind of good impact on those animals. So we can look at basically the failures of the past when we look at fossils. Um, so you can see this is basically the how they think the camel had selected traits for um, back in the day. They look at both their uh, the head shaped with the skull and the teeth and also the bones that themselves since they are more based off of doing a lot of walking in the sand now compared to what they think the camel would have been 65 million years ago. Now, obviously, this would just be the scientist's kind of idea about it. Unless we build a time machine, it's not 100% fact. So keep that in mind with a lot of things that we look at today. Um, should I actually say, not say evidence number four, but this one ties still into number one. So here, let me... Just change that numbering. We rearrange numbers this year. Um, so we got some bioge biogeography happening, which biogeography is just basically studying where organisms live now based on when their ancestors would have lived in the past. Um, and basically it uses the distribution of fossils to look at how things have changed from early on to how they, things have changed now and taking specifically into how their climate might have changed. Um, so this is where later on we're in, in the week we'll take a look at Pangaea. Let me get my head out of the way there, um, where Pangaea kind of looks like this. And they found certain fossils spanning from continent to continent. And if you put them together, it would suggest at one point that we had one of these supercontinents, the Pangaea continent, happening um, on there at one point before things have split up. So... That's evidence number one with fossils, but we can look at it more for a native thing today. And this is in California, and in California, just like with the Galapagos Islands, each one had a slightly different environment that held a different type of bird. This is in California, and in different parts of California, depending on the climate of California, because it stretches basically almost the whole west coast of the United States, there's different salamanders for different locations. Um, number two is dealing specifically more with their body structure. And this was originally done by Darwin and the Globgos, looking at those bird beaks. Basically, you look at an organism's body and look at their general plan and see how their bones are arranged. And if it's similar to another species, they have more similarities to them. If it's further away, they have less similarities. That's what we're getting at with that one. So... What it suggests is that there could be some shared characteristics because of some kind of common ancestor that they both might possess. Um, so, for example, fish, birds, amphibians, reptiles, mammals all have similar body structures. They got an internal skeleton with a backbone. That's why we classify them all together because it links them together in some way based on what they have in similar fashion. So, you can see the different backbones going around in there. 
Um, how we can look at this is in three ways. The first two ways um, kind of play off of each other. We have what's called homologous structures and analogous structures. The first one with homologous means that your structure is similar because you were you had a common ancestor. Um, it was inherited is because you had those structures there to it. Second thing is that we had analogous, which you have a similar body part, but that's because it's just based off of what function you need. It's not that you inherited it together. So an example of this would be like mammals. All mammals have four appendages. They have two in the front, two in the back, whether you want to think of them as like a four-legged creature or a two-legged creature, that's another thing, but you all have two things that are in the front part of your body and two things sticking out of you that's on the back half of your body. Sometimes we count them all as legs, like for a horse. Sometimes we have arms and legs when it comes to like a human or a monkey or something. Um, but because of that basic structure of having those appendages there and the way that they're structured, that would be homologous. Also, if you specifically look at the bones, we have one long bone, two littler bones, a bunch of wrist bones, and some kind of hand-structured bone. Analogous would be the opposite. That would be just that, like, two things have wings because they need to fly. So, like, a butterfly wing versus a bird wing versus a bat wing, they're going to be different, but they have the same characteristics to them. Uh, and the fact that they fly, that's the only thing. Oh, man, I'm yawning a whole bunch of day. Uh, they are, because they need to fly, they have that common trait but it's not because they inherited the same structure. For example, insects don't have bones. Now, bats and birds could be a little bit more related because they have similar bone structure, but between like an insect that flies and a bird that flies, no, that'd be analogous at that point. So here's just showing you all these things would be homologous because they all have a similar structure. They got, and this is really showing you the bones. They have the big arm bone up top, that's your humerus. They have some kind of ulna and radia. Radius is how they put it. They have the then wrist bones, the hand bones, and then the finger bones. Notice that it looks a little bit different. Some are a little bit more altered than others. Like you got your little chicken wing here for our bird, but it still has two bones. It has the little hand bones at the end. There's just not as many as we have. So different animals would have them structured differently. And if you look at the flippers, if you look at the bones underneath the flippers, they do have fingers underneath those, even though they just have basically what you would think of as flippers, giant paddles almost. They do have these separate um, flipper parts going on there. Uh, the final thing that we can look at and I'm going to move this down a little bit into my examples to so get my head out of the way, is what's called vestigial, where you have a structure that you inherit, but your body doesn't really use it. It's basically lost most of its original function. For example, dolphins and whales. If you've ever wondered some more reasons of why they're classified as mammals instead of as fish or some other thing like that, um, is because they have hip bones, but they just don't have tiny legs anymore. They have lost... Over time, legs became unfavorable because having little things that stick out was not aerodynamic for their body. So those dolphins were a little bit slower. They were the ones getting eaten um, by like orcas and whatever eats a dolphin. Um, whereas the ones that were more smooth, meaning they had tinier legs, um, were the ones that were successful and they passed on their tiny littler legs until legs didn't become a thing. Um, pretty much for them, but they still have tiny little hip bones. And here's a nice little picture showing you the skeleton and where those tiny little hip bones are at. That's their entire hip plus leg that is left now in a blue whale there. Or, sorry, that's a baleen whale to it. Um, some other things, if we take a look at humans, we have a lot of different things. Uh, our appendix, and why you can get your appendix removed and not really worry too much about it, um, is because basically allowed us to digest plant material. Our diet has changed beyond just eating the barks off of trees, so our appendix is no longer needed to digest that type of food. Um, but you can still digest a little bit of it because it still has some um, very, very basic functions to it. But if you went outside and t snapped off some bark and ate it, 
that's not going to be good for you. And um, then wisdom teeth. It's previously used to help us grind up plant tissue. We become more of an omnivore, though. Um, so we do not have that need for having that extra set of teeth, which is why you usually get your wisdom teeth removed and why our jaws don't really like it to fit in um, because it's basically not something that is needed anymore for humans. Um, but it came from because of a common ancestor that we had that would have had those kind of traits and features to it. You can also think about your coccyx, the tailbone, as something like that too. We don't have a tail, but we have a little bit of an extension coming off of our spine that would be the basis of a tail if we were to have one. But we don't because we sit. It would hurt if you had a tail and sat in our, most of our chairs that we have now. Um, evidence number three is what is called embryology, which is where we look at embryos, which is the early development of organisms. Um, so basically we study the embryos and how similar that they are. You kind of got some, um, so these are adults, clearly different. If we were to look at the baby forms of them, which is kind of what is happening at the bottom here, the very beginning, they kind of look the same because as we develop, we develop similarly before we start to show the differences and that's what embryology is all about. So early development to these creatures are similar because we have a whole bunch of these different things. It suggests that there is some kind of relation to some kind of common ancestor, and that's why those early stages are similar to each other. Because if we take a look at this, I love this part. So here are six different animals. One of them is a human. Can you pick out the human from the lineup? Probably not. It's a little bit hard to do. But if I show you the rest of them as they get further and further in it, you can start to see some of their specific characteristics coming into play. To where we have a snake, a chicken, a, I think this is the possum, a cat, bat, and then a human. Yep, there we go. So the human was the one at the end. But early on, it has a lot of similarities to each other. Man, I don't know why I'm so yawning today. Uh, and there's just more examples showing you how they are very similar in the um, front part of it as opposed to the back. So there you can see some of the more similarities to it there. And the last one, which should not be entitled number five, this should be entitled number four, is DNA because we have DNA that can prove stuff now. So since the you know discovery of DNA, scientists have been taking the DNA of lots of different animals. And they've been... <coughs> Man, I'm having all kinds of problems today. Ah, oh, it's that test and stuff. Um, all that walking around and stuff today. Uh, scientists infer that the species inherited many of the same genes from a common ancestor, which give them their similarities. And they can actually look at the DNA to see whether or not that DNA is actually similar or how much it actually is different. And they've done these with a variety of different animals uh, to show a variety of different things. Because um, basically they just look at the genes. And if you have that trait, let's look at the genes. How closely do your genes match up? The more similar your DNA is to something, the more closely related you are as a species. So I got two examples of this um, that they've recently changed. They've taken the DNA from an elephant and compared it to an elephant shrew, and they're actually very closely related than previously thought. So it's not just a name that it gets it from, but they actually show quite a little bit of DNA similarities. There's the elephant versus the elephant shrew. So you can kind of see a little bit of a trunk kind of on them. We would say they are showing more of a relationship than we previously thought. They have also shown that dogs are related to wolves rather than coyotes. So just by testing different animals, we know which things came from which, which is why they say dogs are basically domesticated wolves at that point um, because their DNA shares very closely to that of a wolf than anything else. So we'd say they would have some kind of connection between the two.
Um, they can also look to see what things are not closely related to each other. Um, so, for example, pandas and red pandas are not actually the same. Pandas is a bear and are linked with bears, whereas a red panda has more DNA similar to that of a raccoon, so they'd be classified more as a raccoon family rather than the bear family to things. So DNA can also work in the opposites to that. And that is objective number three, looking at those four pieces of evidence. I need to make sure to go back and change all those things that say from four to five. Hopefully you stuck around for everything. There's no homework today, so it is just going over this stuff. We are going to use this, though, the rest of the week as we dive into things dealing with the DNA, the embryos, all that kind of stuff. We have different activities coming up with that, so take a look at the videos coming up for the rest of the week. Uh, if you're confused by anything, email me, but there's no homework, so hopefully you're just following along with the notes. Otherwise, I will see you later. Bye.